Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Also featured in the Ferrari 70th Anniversary Pack for Assetto Corsa, this, the 1967 Ferrari 31267. This car ties the oldest that I have ever reviewed thus far in Assetto Corsa. It's tied with the Jaguar XJ13, that car, of course, from 1966 in development from the end of the 60s through the early 70s. So this car ties us for the oldest car that we have ever taken a look at here in these review pieces. However, this is a very unique addition to Assetto Corsa, I think you would all agree. The oldest Formula One car that we had had up to this point, the Lotus 49, basically a contemporary to this car. Of course, that car absolutely legendary with the Cosworth DFV. It was the first time that an engine and a chassis had been designed together using the engine as a stressed structural member in the construction of a Grand Prix car. And of course, we all know what the Lotus 49 would go on to achieve. However, at the same time, this is what Ferrari were entering in Formula One. And, well, let's just say it was not as successful as the Lotus 49. But, as an addition to Assetto Corsa, as a look into the past as to how far we have come in Formula One nowadays, this is really a testament to the development of technology, the development of materials and construction, engineering, all of that kind of thing. This is really a cool piece, and it's really a great addition to Assetto Corsa. So today we're going to be having a look at the Ferrari 312. We're going to go into its history, its technical specifications, its competition history, all that kind of stuff. And of course, we're going to go and drive the thing. First of all, a little bit of information about this car. Back in this early era of Formula One, it was very common for cars to race multiple seasons with very little, if any, modifications whatsoever from year to year. And that's the case with this car. The Ferrari 312, now 312 is a designation used by many Ferraris, both from the Grand Prix world as well as in the sports car world. The name 312 refers to the engine configuration on this car. It is a 3-liter 12-cylinder engine. This is a V12. Ferrari also used the same name for its flat 12 configurations with a 180-degree crank angle on that engine. But this is a V12 Ferrari at 3 liters displacement. There about, anyway. The actual displacement displacement is 2,989 cubic centimeters, so we can round it up to three if you want. However, this car, designed and entered by Ferrari for the 1966 through 1969 Formula One season, so you've got four years of a lifespan of a car in this era. Again, this was pretty common at this time because technology, yes, of course, it was always advancing, but the advancement rate of that technology was nowhere near the pace of what it is today. At the end of 2017, for instance, all of the cars currently racing will be deemed obsolete and they'll be consigned to museums. So gone are the days where you could get multiple seasons out of the same package. But that was the case back then, so it was the case in 1966 through 1969. Essentially the same car raced for Ferrari during those four seasons. Bit of history on the car, of course, it was designed by Ferrari for the Formula One World Championship. It was designed by a team led by Mauro Forgheri, of course, he was the chief designer at the time for Ferrari. Its immediate predecessor was the 246 F1, that's the famed shark nose car, and it was succeeded by the 312B for the late 1969 and 1970 championships. In terms of the technical specs on this thing, well, as you can see, it is radically different from the Grand Prix cars, even of the mid-80s, let alone what we're seeing in 2017. We have got ourselves an aluminum monocoque for the chassis. Yes, aluminum. There's no such thing as carbon fiber. I don't even believe that carbon fiber had been invented yet by this point. Of course, carbon technology, carbon composites, they were being used in aerospace long before they ever found their way into race cars, but I don't even think aerospace had figured out carbon fiber yet by this time. So aluminum was the cheapest and lightest material that they could find at the time, so that's what they were building these cars out of. In terms of our suspension configuration at the front, 
We are talking about double wishbone suspension, as we can see there, looking at the rear section there. There are your two wishbones on the front suspension, and then we have inboard spring dampers. So no push rods, none of that stuff. It's just a straight old traditional double wishbone suspension, very much like what you would find even on a modern road car, certainly of a road car of the era. The rear suspension, again, double wishbones, as you can see here, but we've got a multi-link rear end, as you can see there, the sway bar, the anti-roll bar there being linked with that tie rod between the lower and upper wishbone elements. Really, really cool suspension layout, of course, completely of the era. The engine, as you can see here, it is the Ferrari Type 218. It is a 60 degree bank angle V12, normally aspirated, of course, and you can see those wonderful intake trumpets there and the carburetors. Yep, really, really cool engine. To be honest, it's not that drastically different still to this day from the V12 engine configurations that we see in modern Ferrari road cars. I mean, yes, the displacement is much higher on the modern day road cars, but you can see it's a V12 and Ferrari, of course, legendary for their V12 engines, and there it is. Although I do want to point out, have a look at that exhaust arrangement, that just a mess of primary pipes coming out of that engine there. And you can see we have four main outlet pipes, but you can see all 12 collector pipes coming out of the inside section of that V there. And then they all snake around, they go into collector pipes, and then they just shoot out the back rather unceremoniously. Really cool bit of pipe work, I've got to say, though, of course, all of that would have been hand done. The transmission on this car is the Ferrari Type 589. It is a traditional five-speed manual, and you can see it right there out the back of the car. Fuel was Shell, as Ferrari are still running in Formula One in these days, and the tires are an interesting story. The car started its life in 1966 running on Dunlop radial bias ply tires, but toward the end of its life, 1966, mid-1966, and then all the way up through 1969, it ran on the Firestones that you can see here. So this, this car is being modeled after the 1967 spec of this car, so it's running on the Firestones. Really, really cool. In terms of its competition history, over the course of 1966 through 1969, the car entered into 38 races. It won just three of them. It took pole position for seven of them and set fastest lap for three of them. It did not win a driver's or constructor's championship for Ferrari. However, notable drivers include Lorenzo Bandini, John Surtees, Ludovico Scarfiotti, Chris Amon, and Jackie Ix. So we do have some pretty famous names who did get their chance behind the wheel of this car. Really cool. It's always very interesting to have a look back at these older cars and, and start to think about what it must have been like back in the day because if you compare this to what we see in modern Formula One, there is effectively no crossover whatsoever either in terms of car design or the technologies that we see. It is completely alien to what we're used to. But you can start to get an appreciation for just how insane <laughs> these drivers must have been because what we've effectively got here is a fuel tank with wheels on it and an engine bolted to the back. And, and we'll see this much more clearly when we take some of the bodywork off as well as when we go into the cockpit. The car is full of fuel. That's it. It's basically a wing tank off of the underwing of uh, a P-38 plane from World War II, if you want to sort of get that kind of comparison into your head. You had the underwing tanks on World War II aircraft, they were just full of fuel, they would be jettisoned if the plane needed to get into a, a high maneuver situation, and well, that's effectively what these cars are. They're full of fuel, there's an engine bolted to the back, and there's a driver sitting in there amongst all of the fuel and the really hot engine behind him. So it's a rolling bomb. It really is. And there's absolutely nothing in the way of crash protection. There's virtually no rollover protection. We talk about the anti-penetration panels that are in the, the sides of the monocoque in a modern F1 car. They didn't really even know what a monocoque was in this area. Yes, the construction on this is an aluminum monocoque, but it's, it's, all, it's all bolted together with separate panels that are riveted into place. There's essentially no rigidity in a car like this, and in terms of crash tolerance, there's zero, absolutely zero. So the guys who were driving these things back then, I mean, yes, you can make the argument that they didn't know any better, but from a modern perspective, you've got to have a death wish to be driving one of these things competitively. It's just, wow. You really start to gain a perspective of great respect for these guys who were driving this car competitively back in the day because, I mean, just nothing. Absolutely nothing to save you if you got it wrong. 
Enough about the historical's perspective on this car. Let's just have a look at what Kunos have managed to give us here. Again, they have done an absolutely resplendent job inside and out with the modeling. Because these cars are the way they are, they have very little in the way of bodywork. They have very little in the way of aerodynamics. I would say that there's essentially zero aerodynamic benefit anywhere on this car apart from the general cigar shape of it. So everything's exposed here. We don't have wings, we don't have turning vanes, we don't have crash structures, we have nothing to obscure our view of all of the mechanical workings of this thing. Just having a look at the nose section here, you can see that Kunos have given us a great rendering of that radiator matrix inside. Very nice mesh work, and then of course the bodywork itself looking absolutely smooth and flawless as ever. Good job, Kunos. We mentioned the suspension configuration before. There's your front suspension. Very simple. Upper and lower wishbones, and then they're all connected to inboard spring dampers. No push rods, none of that in this era. And you can actually see the brake line coming out from the inner section of the monocoque going out to the brake caliper there, which of course is also all exposed. Really nicely done. Looking across the top side of the front end, you can see the gills cut there for a little bit, perhaps, of aerodynamic gain. But for the most part, that's to cool the brake master cylinder and all that kind of thing. And then on the top of the monocoque, you can see that fuel filler valve. Yep, that is where the main fuel filler is for the fuel tanks, which effectively run down the sides of the car, in addition to being in front of the driver as well. So the driver's legs are actually sitting underneath part of the fuel tank, and then the outer wings of the fuel tank where we would expect to see the side pods on a modern Formula 1 car, they extend all the way around the sides of the cockpit. So the driver is literally sitting inside the fuel tank, if you want to think of it that way. Looking across the midsection here, you can see the wonderful aluminum panels here and the rivets holding them on. Very nicely modeled, of course. And then you can see, well, of the era, the mirrors just bolted to the side of the car. They are, of course, aluminum structures there. Very nice into the cockpit there. You can see there's your gear lever. It looks like first gear is a dog leg back toward the driver. And then, yep, there's your cockpit instruments, an actual dashboard with with gauges and needles. Yeah, none of this digital stuff. Digital technology had barely been invented when this car was racing. Really, really cool. Moving toward the back, you can see these brace structures along the rear edge of the cockpit surround, I guess you could call it, for want of a better term, and then they link up to the rear suspension, just, I would assume, to give the car a little bit more rigidity, because of course that engine has a lot of rotational inertia, and it would be imparting a lot of torsional stresses into the chassis as the revs changed, so a little bit of bracing there, go into the rear suspension, and then you've got the rear suspension proper, and you can see some of those shock absorbers there, mounted at about 45 degrees relative to the lower wishbone interesting. Of course, because everything's exposed, there's the engine as we took a look at before. You can see it's a dry sump system, so we've got oil tanks up top there just behind the roll structure. What you could call a roll structure. It's what it's supposed to be. I don't think it would actually be functional if the car did roll, but there it is. And then you can see that V12 in all of its glory. Very nice detail, of course. Get in close on the back end. Now we can see that rear suspension and some of the other electronics. I use that term very vaguely, of course, in that sense. But you can see the distributor there on the rear of the valve cover here on the left-hand side. So, yep, there's your distributor with your 12 leads going to the 12 spark plugs there, six on each side, of course. And then you can see the gearbox, the gearbox casing, and the inboard-mounted rear brake discs. Of course, all steel brakes at this time because carbon had really yet to be invented. Coming to the back end here, you can see another electronic ignition source. So this car, obviously, it, it would not have had that sort of ignition system in the day. You can see that MSD distributor box there. That is an electronic uh, ignition box of some sort. That car would not have been running that back in the day. It would have been a mechanical distributor running from actual points. Um, there would have been the distributor would have been attached to one of the timing gears on the engine and from there you would have had your ignition timing but apparently when Kunos did their research when they surveyed one of these cars they found one that's still in running order and it has since been updated with electronic ignition but all of this would have been mechanical back in the day of course but cool you can see that a distributor box it really just tucks in nicely here on the rear shelf for want of a better term just bringing all of the components in really nicely on the sprung section of the car minimizing the unsprung weight off the back of the gearbox very very cool just so much 
metal work going on here. Everything is everything would have been hand done, and of course, well, it maybe looks a little bit cluttered, a little bit unorganized, but remember, aerodynamics really didn't exist at this point, so they just needed to get the stuff on the car someplace, and, well, if you ran out of space inboard, you put it outboard here, slightly behind the rear axle. Just really cool. You can see some semblance of a rain light there. It's not operable, but uh, there it is, and yeah. There's really not much to talk about in terms of the, the technical details because we can see all of them plain as day. I just love those exhausts though, that they just come up out of the top of the center of the V and then they just shoot out the back. It's the path of least resistance. Of course, the truly ideal solution might be, arguably, to just have the exhausts come out of 12 primary pipes and just vent straight up to atmosphere, but Perhaps, Ferrari, we're looking at the flow dynamics of the exhaust and maybe trying to accelerate them a little bit with those collector pipes, but there they are. <laughs> just, It's just really cool. It's all out in the open. There are no mysteries here. Formula One was not quite as secretive back then. Everything was just plain as day for everyone to see, and really... The technical revolution came from Lotus. Ferrari were not technical leaders at this time, as the competition history suggests, so, well, this is what it is. Plain as day, boom, V12, and it's a rolling bomb. <laughs> it's just absolutely immense. I mentioned that there's essentially no crash structure in this car, and I mean that. We can actually remove the nose cone and have a look at what's underneath. Yeah. Mentioned that radiator from the outside. Well, there's the actual radiator, and then behind it you've got, well, you've got a little bit of a bulkhead. And then you have your brake system. Looks like we have three master cylinders on the brakes. And then we have some, um, some fluid reservoirs, probably for brake fluid. And then behind that, there's your fuel tank. Yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> it's absolutely bizarre. But that's what it was back in the day. And the drivers didn't know any better. Just, yeah. There's your crash structure. And of course, the driver's legs would be right there. So the triangular section you can see is effectively the footwell, and that would be the first thing that would come into contact with any hard, immovable object. So that's how drivers had leg injuries when they had accidents, and of course that's how even worse things occurred. Of course, we do have to mention in in the 1967 Monaco Grand Prix, Lorenzo Bandini, who we mentioned earlier, he was killed in this car, and it's very easy to imagine how that could happen. There was an accident. He actually clipped a crane, which was basically on the circuit. It was just off the racing line, and that tipped him into the barrier, and the car burst into flames, and it flipped over, and Bandini was trapped underneath the burning car. The rescue effort was just laughable. You could barely call it a rescue effort. By the time they got to him, he was so badly burned that there was no way they could do anything for him. And to make matters worse, there was a television helicopter that was hovering directly over the fire, giving more oxygen to that fire and just making it burn even more intensely. So, yes, Lorenzo Bandini, he was a casualty of this car. And, well, that's what motor racing was of the era. It was an incredibly dangerous undertaking. It still is dangerous today, but I think we can all agree that the net risks that a driver is taking in terms of risking his own mortality, they're certainly tremendously diminished in the current era compared to what this was. Anyway, on a little bit of a lighter note, we looked into the cockpit before. Very nice detail inside. And, of course, we could go into the cockpit. So let's do so. And in the cockpit here, we're sitting ever so slightly high, but this is basically the view that we'll get when we're driving the thing. Very, very, very sparse, and it's what you would expect. This padding along the sides of the cockpit and along where the driver sits, that's just for show. It's just to cover up the bare aluminum that is making up the fuel tank that the driver is sitting inside. This contour section, it's just been cut out of the fuel tank so the driver can sit in there. He is in a bathtub of fuel, basically, so... When this car did go off and Bandini was inside, the first thing to absorb the energy of that impact was the fuel tank, and of course it immediately ruptured and, well, fuel splattered onto something hot, whether it was the brakes or the exhaust, whatever it was, it just burst into flames. Of course, we're basically talking about aviation gasoline in this era, so extremely flammable and 
just one spark is all it takes and then you've got yourself a proper conflagration however in the cockpit you can see the instrumentation basically the same as a road car of the era it looks like we have a voltmeter off to the bottom right of the dashboard and then the gauge off to the right in our field of view you can see water and oil temperature you can see aqua and olio there for water and oil that's in degree c in the center, we've got a tachometer that goes up to 12,000 RPM, but we'll be shifting at about 10,000 in this car. And then to the other side of that, we have oil pressure in the old measurements of kilograms per cubic centimeter. Of course, that would now be measured in bar, if not PSI, but that was the old money measurement that these guys were using. So you've got oil pressure on the left, your tack in the middle, and then your water and oil temperature with that two needle gauge on the right. There's your gear stick. So it's a five-speed box. It looks like first gear is a dog leg back toward the driver. And then, of course, you have a gate for reverse as well. The other thing of note in this cockpit, have a look. What do you not see in here? I'll wait. Have you guessed yet? Well, if you said seat belts, uh, you're correct. There are no seat belts in this car. Yes, back in 1966 through 1969, these drivers, by and large, were racing without seat belts. Yeah, so that is what we're talking about. I said that some of these guys perhaps had a death wish when they got into a Grand Prix car. I am not joking, because... <laughs> you're going to be doing 180 miles an hour in this thing and we're going to drive it at the old Monza circuit around the banking so you're properly doing 180 miles an hour plus around the banking and into Curva Grande for example and you've got no seat belts it's absolutely spellbinding it really is and again you can make the argument that these guys didn't know any better because seat belts really weren't even in road cars at this time either so no one would even think to put them in a race car but still it's whew, the, yeah i i have nothing but sheer awe for these guys who did this because i i wonder because of course many of these guys who raced these cars are still with us i wonder if you ask them today would they do it again i i would venture to say most of them would say no because just just with the knowledge that we have now understanding what happens in a crash situation and yeah unbelievable absolutely crazy even if i have the opportunity in the real world to drive this car give me seat belts please anyway the other cockpit details here you can see no cockpit surround in a modern sense, so the side of the bodywork just comes up basically to the driver's shoulders and then his upper shoulders, his neck and his head completely exposed. They barely even wore helmets in this era. Here's what I guess you could call a headrest. It's just some fabric back here held under tension for a little bit of cushions just so his head doesn't smack into the oil tanks at the front of the engine there. And then your roll structure, what little of it there is. Just wow absolutely wow leaving the cockpit yeah 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 this is this is the beast this is what we're gonna be dealing with here again just there's your crash structure your radiator and then the footwell no protection at all just crazy to think that these guys were racing these and that they were they were basically traveling at speeds that the modern cars do on a regular basis but with with so much less infrastructure around them in case things went wrong just unbelievable unbelievable commitment unbelievable courage could you call it stupidity yes you absolutely could but wow just wow of course we do have to drive this car, and we are going to do just that next. As I mentioned before, we're going to go to Monza in its 1966, guys. The full road course with the banking. So, yes, that is definitely going to be an experience. We will see you back in 1966 at Monza next. Welcome to 1966 and welcome to Monza. Before we get out on track, of course, we're going to have a look through the setup screen and show you what's going on with this Ferrari 312. Here on the gear display, we've got our gearbox first through fifth gear plus the final drive ratio adjustable any way you like. If you adjust the final drive ratio all the way to its widest setting, you'll see that on the default gearing, we can hit 296 miles per hour in a straight line. Of course, once again, this is assuming no friction, so yeah, that's, that's just not ever going to happen. We're going to run the default gearing for the most part. We'll extend fifth gear ever so slightly. 
Tires, you've got a single compound to choose from, the GP67 Vintage Compound here in Aceto Corsa. Tire pressures default to 20 PSI all around, however, they can go all the way down to 12 or all the way up to 30 PSI if you so desire. These are bias ply radials, so basically they're road tires of the era. Back in this day, there was essentially no difference between a road tire or a race tire, so basically keep the pressures higher than you certainly would want to do on a modern car fuel. We've got it zeroed out right now to keep the engine quiet, but the maximum capacity is 160 liters. It defaults to 30 liters from the start, so at the start of the race, you would definitely get those full tanks because these guys did not really refuel in this era, so again, we mentioned the driver sitting inside the fuel tank, more or less, so this was a rolling bomb, particularly at the start of the race. Alignment, camber and toe on all four corners, default value shown here. Dampers, your bound and rebound settings for all four corners. Drivetrain, here's where you make your differential adjustments in power, closed, and, and preload. Easy for me to say. Generic engine limiter, that's your rev limiter. It defaults to 100, goes all the way down to 96 if you want, or all the way up to 100, of course, which is its default and maximum setting. Brake bias at 59%, and brake power at 100%. Suspension, anti-roll bars, front and rear, plus the wheel rates and ride heights. That covers everything on the setup screen. No aerodynamic adjustments to speak of. Of course, there are no wings on this car. If it does create any downforce whatsoever, it is a very marginal amount just by the shape of the bodywork and the velocities relative of the air going across the top and bottom sections of the car, but really you're not thinking about aero in this thing. The only time that aerodynamics ever comes into the equation is when you're running with other cars and you pick up a bit of a draft. That's about it in terms of aerodynamics, and that's about it in terms of the setup screen on this car. We'll put some fuel on board, we'll run the default 30 liters, and we'll do a couple of laps here at Monza. First off, in the cockpit, you can see everything is alive. No digital instrumentation to speak of, but we've got our tachometer front and center. We can see the engine's idling at just about 2,500 RPM. To the right, we have our, auto, our water and oil temperature, and then you have the oil pressure to the left, and the wonderful sound of that Ferrari V12. I've got the pedals there in the lower left, as always, as you can see, and we're supplementing that with our digital tack and gear indicator, just so that you can see what gear I am in. We're in first right now, we're letting the clutch out, giving it a little bit of throttle along the way, and we are getting underway here at Monza. here, just getting ourselves oriented and up to speed. You can see immediately we are thrust onto the banking, and yes, it's a very bumpy affair. This banking is anything but smooth. It is a concrete surface. It's basically made of the same stuff that old runways would have been made of, so it's, yeah, it's perilous, and we're not even up to speed yet. We're going to be going roughly 40 miles per hour faster than that once we get up to speed. In terms of these tires, like we said, they're basically road tires. There's not much of a difference in this era between a road tire and a race tire, so tire temperature is not much of a factor. Of course, tire wear is, but you don't really have to worry about tire temperatures. They're basically ready to go straight out of the box. You can see immediately the suspension working over time. You can see a whole bunch of extraneous movement in the steering. That is pure reactions to the bumps. Not much damping in the suspension whatsoever. A lot of suspension movement, but in terms of bump damping, it doesn't really exist. You hear that V12 really singing though, 9,500 RPM as we head into Curva Grande. On the brakes, there's fourth gear. Feeding the power in progressively and now hard back on the throttle. Winding it out toward the exit, no barrier of course. Just run off into the trees. Breaking for the first Lesmo. And here you can really start to see just how relatively unchanged the Monza circuit is when you compare it to what it was in 1966. The Lesmo corners are very recognizable. This second Lesmo here is a little bit more of an open curve than it is in its modern configuration, but still, basically the same lines that you would take today apply all the way back in 1967. Really cool. Raskari. Today this is a chicane. Here it's just 
a gradual left-hand sweeper. Back straight, however, completely unchanged, as is Parabolica, as we will see in mere moments. Down into fourth, third, second gear. Parabolica, of course, it's tight on its entry, and then it unwinds toward the exit. Virtually identical to what it is today. Of course, there's a lot more runoff today than there is in 1966. We just have some gravel and then a big wall of dirt to receive us rather unceremoniously when we get it wrong. 170 miles an hour onto the banking. Now, this is the full fury of all of these bumps. It is perilous. Remember at the start of the race, 160 liters of fuel on board. It's all around the driver. If he made the slightest error, or if someone around him made the slightest error and made contact, that's it. That is absolutely it. It's a rolling bomb traveling at nearly 200 miles an hour with no crash protection. There's going to be basically an airplane crash if this all goes wrong. Banking now. Here is where the start finish timing line actually is. Wait for it. Right there. That's it. 184, 185 miles an hour. 9,600 RPM on the crankshaft there. On the brakes. Fourth gear. Pitch it in. On the power. Let the torque sort of even itself out as it twists the chassis. Fifth gear. And on the brakes, fourth, third. First Lesmo. On the power. A bit of a tail slide there. Second Lesmo. Bit of understeer, bit of oversteer. Fourth. Fifth. Underneath the banking now. Now into Ascari, let the breathe, throw it in, back hard on the power. Let it drift out wide toward the exit. Don't pick up the grass if you can help it. Very nice. Back stretch. Got to start braking deceptively early for Parabolica. Such are the brakes on this car. I mean, yeah, they are very good compared to a road car of the era, but compared to a modern Formula One car, they're nowhere. They feel like bottle caps, essentially. Not quite as bad as the drum brakes on the Maserati 250F, but they, <laughs> they may as well be. They don't really have all that much stopping power, even though this is a very light car. About 540 kilograms this thing weighs. Banking, yes, and here's where you can really get a sense of just how light this car is, because it jumps between the bumps here on the banking. You can see all of the motion in the steering. All of that is from the bumps. I am not moving the wheel. I'm just holding on to it and trying to keep it roughly at the same angle as we're going around the corner. All of that bouncing around, that's from the bumps. That's not me. Demonstrate that here. Coming into the banking, I picked my steering angle, and now I'm just holding it there. And you can see all of the motion that starts to come through the steering wheel. That is not my conscious effort turning the wheel. That's just me trying to get it back to where I've set it. Get to the red there on the tack. 9,600 RPM. On the brakes, fourth gear. On the power. Of course, there is no second chicane here. There's no first chicane either. The chicanes were added much later to this circuit. Here. Still got to control it. 
cue, just the way that this thing is somewhat inconsistent from one lap to the next, it really starts to give you a sense of just how courageous or stupid or a combination of both these drivers had to be because, again, this is, this is perilous in a sim. Never mind, actually, I was going to say strapping yourself into this, but there are no seatbelts. So just sitting in here and hoping for the best, <laughs> it's absolutely nuts. Again, just, just get that in your mind. 170 miles an hour onto the banking now, and you don't have seat belts. So not only do you have to hold on to the steering wheel because it's trying to rip itself out of your hands, but you're also holding on to that steering wheel just trying to hold yourself in place in the car. That's it. there as the rear axle momentarily leaves the ground. Yeah. yeah. In terms of handling dynamics, well, it's fast in a straight line as we are evidencing right now, but under the brakes, it's very slow to respond. The steering is very slow to respond in the modern sense. The tires don't generate all that much grip. There's no arrow to speak of. So basically, you drive the car with the throttle, and the steering. The brakes don't even factor in all that much. You use your throttle to determine your, your slip angle through the corner for the most part. At full throttle at high speed, you're not really going to get any slip angle through the corners, but for the medium speed corners like the Lesmos, you're definitely using your throttle input to balance the car. You also use the torque curve of the engine. And by torque curve, I'm not meaning the generation of torque at the crankshaft. I'm meaning the amount of torsional force that the engine, through its rotational inertia imparts into the chassis. You use the torque through the chassis to control the, the, the latitudinal attitude of the car. It's, uh, it's almost as if you, you use the engine to twist the rear axle into the pavement to get your, to get your inside or outside wheels, whatever may be the situation at the time, to get better purchase into the tarmac. It's all, it, it's all very finely choreographed. You've got to get yourself into that mindset of not thinking of the car as a rigid thing. It has to be flexible and your approach through every corner also has to account for that flexibility. Through here, if I try to drive this conventionally, I'm gonna get understeer, but if I just use a couple squirts on the throttle to get that rear axle to twist a bit, then the rear end bites and I can counter steer them to get better purchase for the exit. This is absolutely insanity. I mean, I believe the last time the banking was used for the Italian Grand Prix was in 1966. So, obviously, it's been a long time since we've had any competitive running on the banking. The banking is mostly still intact, though, and I believe you could run a car on it if you wanted to, but uh, don't sign me up for it. There are braver men than I. Sequentially fourth, third, the first Lesmo. Tweak the throttle, there we go. Second Lesmo brake. Tweak the throttle, counter steer, there you go. It's all a very delicate balancing act. It's, uh, it's a bit like dancing. grass there. Style points. On the brakes, fourth. 
third, second. Use the torque, control the drift. Third gear. Fourth. Up into fifth. 9,000 RPM still screaming through the rev range. 174 onto the banking. It's absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous in every sense of the imagination. I don't know how these guys had the courage to do this. I really don't. I could not do this. 100%. No way. Absolutely no way. Yep, get slightly airborne there. Some of the bigger bumps onto the second half of the banking. Now start finish. There's the timing line. So the guy standing in the pits holding those two stopwatches. He stops one and starts the other at the same time. That's your Tag Heuer official timing back in the day. Or whoever is doing the timing for F1 now. That's the Rolex, is it not? Yeah, I think so. Especially how much I pay attention to the little things. Well, luckily there's no diffuser to break. Slightest mistake. The absolute slightest mistake. You can see it wasn't that hard of a tap against the wall, but it just catapults you off to the other side of the circuit. However, strangely enough, the steering is perfectly in line with itself and the car is still completely drivable. So as fragile as it is in some respects, it's actually still quite robust. I do feel a bit more play in the suspension. We definitely knocked something out of alignment on the rear, but the steering is still pretty much dead straight. We had to pit on this lap anyway because we're running out of gas. I think the car feels slightly better now through the corners. We may have stumbled across an ad hoc setup change. to the ever so slightly sheltered pit area here at the old version of Monza. Yes, you can see the car is currently bearing some battle scars from our uh, very brief excursion into the Armco, but uh, yeah, so far so good on this thing. Now I know what you're wondering, hey, isn't that a little bit short here? Well, yes it is. This video is not over yet in its commentated part, however, we did mention this car's chief rival, and of course the one that superseded it almost entirely in Formula 1 of the era, the Lotus 49. Well, we're going to do something a bit different today. We're actually going to attempt to do a live race in this video, one-on-one, -on -one, this versus a Lotus 49. The Lotus 49 will be driven by the AI, and I'm going to be in this thing, and of course... Yeah, we're going to be doing it here at Monza. So a live commentary race, and as they might say in Italian, si vedrà chi vincerà. Next. All right, so we have lined up here on the grid next to the AI in a Lotus 49. We remain in the Ferrari 312. Let's see how these two cars really match up to one another head to head. You can see there I have geared it out in fifth gear for 202 miles an hour. However, I don't know if we're going to be able to achieve anywhere near that without the help of a draft. So we need to stay in touch with him as best as we can. That Lotus 49 on paper is superior to us pretty much in every sense, but you can see outwardly the two cars look very similar to one another. So. Let's see how this goes. First time we've tried an actual race in these review pieces. Just waiting for the lights to come up. There's first gear. Into the torque curve. Lights are out and away we go. 
we get a good initial jump off the line. However, he is going to want to improve his position as soon as possible. So we have to drive the widest Ferrari in existence. We're not going to take fifth gear here into Curva Grande. We're just going to hit the brakes and now try to get on the power as soon as we can. Wind it out for all it's worth. 9600 RPM, there's fifth gear coming into the Lesmo complex for the first time. Let's take the defensive line into the first Lesmo. On the power. All right, now where is that Lotus? I'm sitting slightly far forward here, so I can't see the mirrors. I have to rely on those position indicator arrows. If he gets close enough, they will come up. There he is, he's close enough, we're into Ascari, that's not where I need him to be. Right, he easily powers past us, however, we're gonna pull into his wake here. He's using the grass, he's using everything at his disposal. He's on the brakes, we're on the brakes. Ah, we make contact, that's fine by me. He should have known better than try to pull that off. How's my car feel? It feels fine. That was just a square hit to the side of the car. I don't think we hit the suspension at all. But where is he? Did he go off? Did he hit the barrier? I don't know. So we're just going to have to keep driving this thing as fast as we can until we cross start finish and we get an interval because I honestly have no idea where he is. He could be still stuck in that gravel trap or he could be right on us. Where is the Lotus? We'll get some intelligence when we cross start finish. I'm trying to look in the reflections of my mirror fairings to see if there's any hope of us seeing behind us. I'm trying to listen for his engine as well. Just getting peaks in the left hand mirror across the banking here. I can't see anything, but then again, I can barely see anything in that mirror to begin with. Crossing start finish in a couple of seconds. What is the interval if there is one? There's the line, 1.3 seconds, that's the gap. So he is still running and he is still rather close to us. We've got to hold this together. There's fourth gear, Cuba Grande, we're gonna take the tight line in. On the power as soon as we can. Run out wide for the exit, a little bit of a breathe, fine. Where is the Lotus? He is right on us. There he is, he's on the grass. Oh yeah, <laughs> don't ask me how I held that together. Where did he go? He was on the grass, he tried to overtake. There's no way that he made it around that corner. He didn't hit us. To Ascari, let's keep it in tight. contact on the last lap. It's nowhere to be found in our immediate vicinity. Where is the Lotus? I know he's lurking someplace not far back. I'm gonna just park myself right on the yellow line. Split the difference between the high and low sides. I don't know if he can attack. I don't know which way he's gonna go. Let's just stay parked right in the middle of the circuit here. Where is he? he completed the same number of sectors of the lap, so I know he's close. Don't think he can attack us. Let's call that a win. That's a win for the Minnows. 
the Ferrari in its vastly inferior package. It beats the Lotus 49 on home soil by just over three quarters of a second. The final gap there is .78. That was a lot crazier than maybe it seemed, but yeah, some contact there. But still, just enough for us to edge out the Lotus 49, even though it really is vastly superior to this car. Miracles can happen, and that was certainly a miracle, I must say. The intelligent comparison between our lap times, you can see the Lotus was faster by a second a lap, just about. But we're faster in Sector 2, which is interesting. But Sector 1 and 3, the real high-speed stuff, he was quicker by quite a, uh, quite a margin. Look at that. He's almost one and a half seconds quicker than us in Sector 3, but that was all that we needed. Look at that. My best lap time. Phew. Markedly slower than that Lotus, but that's the gap. That's that's interesting to see. That really, really is. We'll see you back at Monza, however, all alone once again in a few moments. So, welcome back to Monza once again. Now we are by ourselves. I am... Pretty astonished that we were actually able to beat the Lotus 49 in this car. The 49 is all around better. Yes, it is a very similar car, and of course it is a contemporary to this 312, but everything is done a little bit better on that car. The engine is a bit lighter, it makes a little bit more power, it makes a lot more torque, but still, we're able to hold our own now. Yes, I was a little bit dirty, but I think that Lotus was also a bit dirty, taking to the grass to try to overtake on a couple of occasions, so yeah. Um, that's a win, and I'm going to take it, and it does show you that on its day, this Ferrari can work miracles, but one more time around the circuit, just to conclude our final thoughts on this car, and really just to talk about where it fits overall in the Assetto Corsa lineup. As we have seen so far, it is a quick little car. I mean, it's the one car you would expect it to be quick and well it is pretty quick but beyond that it's actually quite a lot of fun to drive now I don't tend to drive these older cars very often simply because I, I personally I have some trouble identifying with them because I wasn't around when these things were racing and according to my demographic stats for my viewers most of you were not around either during the days when this car was racing but as Formula One fans as motorsport aficionados we have to really be students of the history of automobilism, of motorsport. We have to understand where we come from so that we can appreciate where we are today as well as to predict where we may be going in the future. V12 engines, they have been long gone from World of Grand Prix racing since the end of 1995, but here in the mid-60s it was the glory days of the V12s as well as the V8s, obviously with the Lotus 49. V6s were also in Formula 1 before this. The Shark Nose, the 156 car, of course, that was a V6 Dino car. Ferrari, of course, any V6 engine that Ferrari produces is designated as a Dino after the deceased son of Enzo Ferrari. Ferrari hasn't made a V6 car, really, for a very long time, as I missed the shift there. I'm talking about V6 road cars. Obviously, the Formula 1 cars of today are V6 engines. I was half expecting them in 2014 to call the car a Dino, but they didn't, and I'm thinking that they're they're missing an opportunity there in terms of their marketing as well as to pay homage to the heritage of the company, but we'll see. I do think they need to make another V6 turbo road car and call it a Dino. But anyway, that's beside the point. Where does this car fit overall in the Assetto Corsa lineup? Well, it is the perfect companion to the Lotus 49, which we have had in AC for a few years, basically since the game's launch in its initial pre-launch beta specification that we've had since 2014. That's when I started to play with Assetto Corsa as well. You look back through my channel, you'll find videos of Assetto Corsa going back into 2014. And, well, now finally the Lotus 49 has a direct competitor. Yes, the Lotus is a better car, but we did manage to beat it. So that means on the day, perhaps, just perhaps, this Ferrari can pull an upset Therefore, I do think it fits in very nicely with that classic open wheel content. The only problem that we've got in AC is that we don't have more of that sort of content, and that's the second time that I've inadvertently selected 7th gear on my TH8A shifter. Of course, this is not a 7-speed gearbox, it's a 5-speed gearbox, but hey. All in all, kudos, they've done a great job with all of this, as they have done with the SF70H and the F2004. 
before this, of course, completes the trifecta of Formula One cars from the 70th anniversary pack. And honestly, I wasn't really hoping for this car in particular. I voted in the uh, the open voting that they had for this car. I voted for the F1 2000, the 2000 Formula One car. Of course, that took Michael Schumacher back to the top of the world championship after he last won it in 1995. It was his first title with Ferrari, his third overall. I voted for that car. I really wanted to see another V10 F1 car in Assetto Corsa in addition to the F2004, but well, the SF70H1, and as we saw in that review piece, that is also an absolutely wonderful car. The latest round of updates that we haven't talked about here, at least not yet, they really have polished that car, and it's even more drivable now, and I, I like it. Still trying to come to grips with the, the characteristics that have changed since that update, but still it is fast, and it is quite drivable. It's quite tractable. I like that car as well. This one fits very nicely in the context of the other cars that Kudos have been able to give us with this pack. And I can only hope that we can expect this kind of thing to continue from Kudos once in a while. I mean, once a year perhaps. The last time that we had a raft of Ferraris released was about this time last year as well. I remember doing a review of the FXXK also at this old version of Monza. And that car was absolutely spectacular. And this latest 70th edition, 70th anniversary edition pack for Assetto Corsa with a whole bunch of Ferraris absolutely resplendent absolutely love it of course that doesn't say anything about the other race cars that we've got the wonderful 330 and the 250 gto they're also great 288 that we took a look at last week another absolutely brilliant road car all in all kunos i think you've i think this is a renaissance really for kunos they impressed the world back in 2014 when they they took the covers off of Assetto Corsa and everybody just went, wow, myself included, and now really bringing us this authentic, exclusive Ferrari content. It's really, really good. I think we can expect more great things from Kunos as the years continue to unfold before us. Coming toward the latter part of 2017, I don't know if we can expect any more big releases from Kunos in terms of content for this year, but definitely they have really put their heart and soul into this 70th anniversary pack and it definitely shows wonderful additions to the sim all of those formula one cars that we've had and i mean great road cars as well from ferrari wonderful we've got a great assortment now of past and present ferrari models in the sim and if you're a ferrari fan like me you're loving every second of it, it really is a fantastic time to be an assetto corsa fan and a fantastic time to be a sim racer in general We've got great sims out there now. We have great equipment, my Thrustmaster equipment. I absolutely love it. My old Logitech gear was also very good. It served me very well for many years. And of course, you've got companies like Fnatic out there putting direct drive wheels out to mass market. It's a great time to be a simmer. It really, really is. And when you marry that up with the sort of content that we have, it's wonderful really, really is. We're getting the opportunities to do things and to explore cars and to explore circuits that in many cases don't even exist anymore, like this one. This configuration of Monza ceased to exist really at the end of 1970 or so. They started to introduce the chicanes. You got the first and second chicanes now. This second Lismo corner has been cut off quite a bit. Of course, all the barriers have been moved back. You got gravel now. You have asphalt runoff places like the second chicane which isn't even on this circuit the banking of course isn't used anymore and the fact that we're able to experience something like this to get as close as we can get to what it might have been like to drive one of these things at this place back in the day it is really really cool that we've got the ability to turn back the clock a little bit and just get a little taste of what it must have been to drive these cars in anger so many years ago back into the pits here. Couple less little barks out of the V12 because I can't resist. And now back into the pit lane. What can I tell you? It's 
a wonderful little car. It's nowhere near as fast as it could be, but you got to remember, this is the mid-1960s, and this was the state of the art. Nobody had ever really thought about downforce yet. Nobody had ever really thought about putting wings on cars. I mean, yes, in, in Le Mans and in the Can-Am series at this time, people were starting to experiment with things like ground effect. I'm talking about the Jim Hall Chaparral cars with the movable wings and the, and the fans and stuff like that. But, I mean, Formula One, this is what it was. The cars were extremely pure. They didn't have much aero. They didn't even have slick tires. So if you want to get a sense of what it must have been like to be a driver back in that era, I think this is really as close as we can get. This, along with the Lotus 49, really does give you a very deep appreciation for what Formula One was, where it came from, how we got to where we are today, in particular when you compare it to the F2004 and the SF70H, which are also in this pack. It's absolutely on point. It is brilliant in every sense. The modeling on the exterior as well as the interior, the sounds are absolutely awesome. You'll hear them a bit more clearly in a few moments with the external replays, but I mean, it's great. It's 100% wonderful, wonderful addition to the sim. If you haven't, by some ungodly chance, driven this car yet, definitely stop watching this right now and go drive this car because it is absolutely great. I'm not a huge fan of the classic cars, certainly. Not by the 1960s, for sure. I prefer the 80s, really, in terms of my favorite cars to drive. I love the big turbos, I love the big slicks, I love qualifying tires, but, I mean, this is a different cup of tea, definitely. I mean, I think I said something similar in my 250F review from about a year ago, but if you do want to get a sense of what it must have been like, this is definitely the car for you. However... As always, with this review pieces, there are hot laps to come, as well as a replay of the little race that we just had. So we've got hot laps and we've got a race replay coming your way next. Please do stay tuned for that. However, before all of that, I just want to say thank you all very, very much for watching. And of course, thank you very much for your continued support for the channel. I do read all of your comments. I try to respond to as many of them as possible. It's not always possible. I do apologize. However, I appreciate the enthusiasm and I very much appreciate the support. So stay tuned for the hot laps. They are to come. Until next time, though, Ferrari Man 601 saying thank you very much, and we will see you soon.
Oh, <laughs> my